Hello and welcome to the second Ballard Institute Puppet Forum of uh, fall 2020, a remarkable year. The title of this uh, program, this forum is The Renaissance of African-American Object Performance uh, with Edna Bland, Paulette Richards, Schroeder Cherry, and An Anwar Floyd Pruitt. And this event is co-sponsored by the Yukon Department of Art and Art History. So thank you very much to them. Thank you very much to all, all of you uh, for coming. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Edna Bland, in a second. My name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry and at the University of Connecticut. And I'm joined by my Ballard Institute colleague, Emily Wicks, who's behind the scenes making everything happen. She's our director, our manager of operations and collections. <clears throat> we are excited that our museum recently reopened. We're opened on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Make a reservation because it's distanced viewing. <clears throat> Excuse me, but as always, admission to the museum is, is free. Uh, next week, <clears throat> excuse me, we hope to be open for our next month. We open, hope to be open for three days per week. So please come and see our uh, World of Puppetry exhibition, our Shakespeare and Puppetry exhibition, and our Paul Vincent Davis and the Art of Puppet Theater exhibition. We're doing a lot of our programming online, including a free online Halloween Shadow Stories workshop that takes place tomorrow, the 23rd from 6 to 9 p.m., led by two of our uh, talented Yukon Puppet Arts students, Elise Van Ness and Felicia Cooper. I wanted to mention, uh, because when, last night at our tech rehearsal, this came up, another area of African-American puppetry that's visible at the moment, the Puppet Showplace Theater uh, in Brookline Village in Boston area. The Puppet Showplace Theater's Black Empowerment Grant and Creative Research Residency. Uh, the recent work of, of six of the grantees is now available online. So that's super interesting to, to look at. We wanted to share with you right now um, a, a, our celebration of a, and a kind of soft opening of our Living Objects African-American Puppetry Online Catalog, which uh, is the result of uh, the exhibition that actually Schroeder and Edna and Paulette were a big part of. Paulette uh, Richards uh, curated this or co-curated it. I helped with that. and. Uh, the, our online resource includes images and artists' biographies, video documentation, and I think especially over uh, 20 new essays and scripts and interviews. Thank you for Emily for showing us this in a calm manner. So <clears throat> uh, we're really excited that, that this uh, resource is now available, Minstrel Performance and the History of African Amer American Puppetry is one section. Uh, it's really a catalog or an anthology of work about African American puppetry, uh, puppetry in the community with works by Schroeder, Cherry, and many other people, as you can see here, Afro-diasporic storytelling and culture, including an article about Mamalengo traditions in Brazil. Uh, Paulette Richards, as you can see, has contributed a number of essays and interviews, representations and appropriations of blackness, uh, as you can see. And uh, all of these are available online. You click on the PDF and you get the PDF and next steps, which is a, there you can see how you get the PDF of uh, Ramalika Imhotep's uh, article about Tar Baby. So uh, this includes uh, three puppet plays um, by different uh, puppeteer playwrights and a postscript by our friend Sheila Gaskins. So uh, we're really happy to make this work available. We're excited by it. We hope that it might be useful to puppeteers and scholars and Africana studies and everybody who's interested. So wanted to make sure you know about that, go to our website. I'm sure that Emily posted the link to that. <clears throat> our moderator for this evening is Edna Bland. 
who's a frontline educator down in Florida working face to face with students and online at the same time, a teaching artist, a puppeteer and arts integration specialist who honed her knowledge and skills at such institutions as the Kennedy Center, the Juilliard School, the Globe Theater in London. Prior to becoming an educator, Edna worked in the entertainment industry in such organizations as the New York Emmy Awards and Sony Music as Entertainment. As a puppeteer, she was mentored by the late Carol Spinney, uh, who played Big Bird and uh, recently passed away, a Connecticut rel uh, neighbor almost of, of ours at the Ballard Institute, and Dr. Loretta Long, Susan from Sesame Street. And she's been a touring puppeteer in Jane Henson's Nativity. Uh, her work has been exhibited at the Ballard Institute as part of the Living Objects exhibition, and then as part of the South Florida Puppetry Guild's exhibit at Miramar Arts and Cultural Center. Uh, Edna has an MFA degree from entertain in entertainment creative writing and an MS degree in entertainment business from Full Sail University, a BS degree in organizational management from Nyack University, um, and an ASS degree from Five Towns College. Please welcome Edna Bland. Thank you for being here, Edna, and I'm gonna step away. Thank you, John, so much. And good evening, everyone. Um, as John mentioned, I was honored to have been selected as one of the, the artists to be at the Ballard Institute uh, and Museum's Living Objects Exhibition. And um, I am honored to be your moderator for this evening, uh, for this in-depth conversation about African-American puppetry. So without further ado, let's welcome and let me introduce our uh, amazing panelists who are scholar scholars, uh, puppetry artists, and people who I consider dear friends of mine. Uh, the first up that uh, we will present is Dr. Paulette Richards, an independent researcher and teaching artist who uses animatronic puppetry to introduce K-12 students to basic robotics concepts. She has taught animatronic puppetry workshops at Decatur Makers, the DeKalb County Public Library, the Center of Pu for Puppetry Arts, and the Ballard Institute Oh, I'm sorry, and the Puppeteers of America 2017 National Festival. She served as the co-curator with Dr. John Bell of the Ballad Institute and Museum's Living Objects African American Puppetry Exhibit and was recently elected to the board of UNIBA USA, the US chapter of the Union International de la Marionette. The Black Lives Matter movement she writes, has been by research, feel, um, feel, I'm sorry, feel urgent and reliant for the first time in my life because I see puppet, puppet theater and object performance as a powerful mode of resistance to objectification of Black bodies. Richards is completing two essays about Black faith material character, characters and the ritual functions of white supremacy and a community of African-American doll collectors. She is currently planning an ex exhibition of African-American puppetry that should open at the Center of Puppetry Arts in the fall of 2021 and researching a book of object performance in the Black Atlantic. Welcome, Dr. Paulette. Hello, Edna. And next, <laughs> I'm fine, thank you, dear. And next, we'd like to welcome Dr. Schroeder Cherry. Dr. Schroeder Cherry <laughs> began making art and playing with puppets as a child in Washington, D.C. Over time, he incorporated his childhood pastime into his 30 years of professional museum work. Dr. Cherry has held positions at museums across the U.S., including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Smithsonian Institute, Anacostia Museum, the Studio Museum of Harlem, the John Paul Getty Museum in California, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and the Maryland Historical Society. Uh, at the Lily, Lilla Wallace Funds in New York, he was, a, sorry, he was a program officer for museums and art 
organizations. And between 2002 and 2010, he served on staff at the Institute of Museum and Library Services in Washington, DC. First as a deputy director for museums and later as counselor of director of, of, to the director. Cherry earned his bachelor of arts degree in painting and puppetry from the U University of Michigan, a master's degree in museum education from the Georgetown, I'm sorry, George Washington University and a doctorate in museum education from Columbia University. He has traveled nationally and internationally to speak uh, learning, I'm sorry, to speak on learning in museums. Sherry currently resides in Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you. <laughs> a little tongue twister there. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here, thank you. All these museums. <laughs> and of course, last but not least, the, the, the honorable <laughs> Anwar Floyd Pruitt. Anwar is an interdisciplinary artist from Milwaukee, Milwaukee Wisconsin, focusing on puppetry and self um, port, port, um, portraiture, portraiture, okay, uh, and community art. A 2020 FF, MFA graduate of the University of Wisconsin, Madison, Floyd Pruitt also earned a BA in psychology from Harvard University and a BFA in sculpture from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. In addition to teaching puppetry workshops, Floyd Pruitt produces and performs a family-friendly hip-hop sing-along called Hip Hop Puppet Party, which was awarded at Madison Arts Commission Blank Grant last Blank Grant last winter. Um, I'm sorry, last winter he was invited to participate in Roots of the Spirit. Uh, Imagine Puppets at Art Serve in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he um, uh, displayed a collection of puppets made with youth uh, from the Dane County Juvenile Detention Center. Anwar is the winner of the 2020 Russell and Paula Panzenko MFA Prize at the Shazan uh, Museum of Art, where he first solo ambition. Um, let's see, Supernova, Charlotte and Jean's Radical Imagination Station opens this fall. Most recently, Floyd Pruitt installed an abstract sculpture, Wildflower Garden Outdoor as part of a Warm Farm Institute Fermentation Fest. Wow, you guys, <laughs> you had a lot for me to say tonight. <laughs> But I'm so honored that you guys are here and part of this. Um, a lot of work you guys have done as artists, as educators. Um, and uh, it, it's just wonderful to start this conversation and have this conversation this evening um, with what, uh, such a wonderful group of uh, performers and uh, educators. So let's start, let's just dive right into this, okay? Um, it seems that there is a renaissance of uh, African-American puppetry that is happening. Um, and we'll talk about if this is truly a movement or not. Puppetry, as we know, African-American puppetry has been around for, for years, right? It's been around forever. Um, but let's kind of dig into why is it really relevant right now? Is it because of the social injustice that's happening in our country? Is it, um, you know, Black Lives Matter? Like, what is it that is now bringing us to the table? Okay, um, but let's kind of define first uh, what is African American puppetry, or basically. Um, is there a singular style, do you think? I mean, we all know there are, there are several um, genres of puppetry, um, but, you know, do you think that there is any singular style that we, we mostly are embracing? Why and why not? Paulette, would you like to start, please? Oh, okay. So um, I will go to the definition that the advisory board for the Living Objects exhibit came up with. Schroeder was part of that board. What is a black puppet? 
and we decided the answer is a puppet that was built or performed by an African-American person. Um, the exhibit showed a wide range of styles and in our research, the only commonality or uh, distinctive thing that we found uh, between African-American puppetry and American puppetry in general is a drive to, um, I'm getting a note that my microphone is doing weird things, so I'm moving closer. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you can just speak up a little bit more. Yeah, Thank a you. drive to resist um, negative caricatures of African-Americans that are prevalent in the popular culture. So that's my piece. We'll see what Schroeder and Amor have to say. Yeah. yeah well, when we talked about African-American puppetry, as, as Paul had mentioned, we decided we had to define it. And the best definition we came up with was either by a puppet produced or performed by an African-American. And that helped us to distinguish puppets that looked African-American or just looked Black um, diaspora, but made from other people. We, had, we were really conscious about that. And in terms of that definition, we looked to the art world. Um, there is a phrase, Af what is African-American art? And those gave us some guidelines um, to follow for that. In terms of style, what we found, even in our exhibition, was people were doing a variety of types of puppetry. Shadow puppets, rod puppets, hand puppets, marionettes. Um, I found it interesting that there, the puppetry that we see in America is primarily informed by European puppetry, because that's what we see. We see on television puppets that were um, following the styles of puppets that came out of France or Germany or Czechoslovakia or Russia. We didn't see so much puppets that were inspired by African puppetry traditions. We just don't, we just don't see it that much. And um, there are a few people who are looking at African works, but African puppetry comes out of their traditional uh, performances that include drum, drumming, dancing, uh, singing, it's, it's holistic, as opposed to European puppetry, which tends to be the more linear and, and story form. Anwar? Well, <clears throat> I think to uh, you know, speak to uh, Schroeder's point, there's an, <clears throat> pardon me, yeah, there's, I mean, an interesting, uh, you know, point there about whether the puppets are used for entertainment or whether they're used for, uh, you know, just part of community and culture, uh, or so that community culture versus uh, that everyone is participating in. Um, and I don't know, I think, you know, I, I read that and heard that many of the Black puppeteers in America are also educators. And so I think that many of us are taking puppetry uh, and using it in that sort of traditional sense or attempting to use it in that traditional sense, you know, in classrooms or at uh, libraries and places trying to create community. Um, and so, I, you know, for me, I think that that is one of the sort of essential uh, parts of, you know, African-American puppetry, um, regardless of sort of the style. Fantastic. So, well, do you find that African-American puppetry tends to be more um, human figures or, or objects, animal objects, whatever, and, and, and why? Anyone can just chime in whenever you like. I, from what I see, African American puppetry usually focuses on the body, either um, people or, or animals, but mostly people. Even when, you, even when they're telling African folk tales, um, I think Paulette mentioned that Akbar Emtara out of, out of Atlanta, when he does the folk tales, African folk tales, even though they're about animals, he generally focuses on the people in his poetry. Yes, Akbar um, worked for many years as a storyteller at the Wren's Nest, which is the home of Joel Chandler Harris. And so he is a master of the Br'er Rabbit cycle of stories, but he, usually did not work with his puppets at the Wren's Nest. So um, the puppets that I have seen from him are primarily human figures, yes. Oh, and can you all hear me better? Because I put yes. on my, yes. okay, Much great. 
And as Schroeder said before, that we tend to adopt the European, uh, you know, version of it. So, do you think that's that's the reason why it's it's more, um, you know, a human figure? Because you know, we grew up with the Sesame Streets, and um, you know, uh, uh, you can even say uh, Mr. Rogers. Uh, I'm telling my age, right? <laughs> and well, you know, even yeah, going yeah. back a little bit older than you, Edna, um, <laughs> in, in the 50s, in, tel in early television, you had a, a plethora of puppet shows in, in local look in local places. Mm -hmm. We had yeah. Clan and Ollie. Um, you had uh, children's shows like in Washington. You had Captain Kangaroo, Mr. Yes. They always had actors, but they had puppets on the side. So it's about exposure. It's about what we what we've seen. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and I know later we're going to talk a little bit about, well, we can even start now about African puppets uh, uh, from Africa versus African American. And so um, uh, anybody have any expertise about that? What did those puppets look like when the, the griots uh, used the puppets um, in order to help tell stories to, um, in, in, you know, the history of their uh, their tribe. So um, were those human in nature or animal or what What do you think? What do you know? Are you talking about African culture? Yes, I said African, African. Okay. Um, yeah, even what you described is more European narrative. Um, the African <laughs> puppets tended to be a group of, a group of puppets on one side, chanters on another side, drums on one side, and you may even have some, some dancers, but all of this is going on simultaneously. So it, it was never, it was typically, and I'm speaking most, mostly of West African puppetry, like from puppetry in Mali and Senegal. Um, it was an ensemble. It was not, it was not a griot using puppet. It was, it was an ensemble. And many times the stories were based on um, occurrences that happened in the village. And puppets, and everybody knew with who the puppets were talking about, but they never really described them by name. You know, you know who was having an affair with whom, you know who stole what, you know who like <laughs> something naughty. And the puppets could act that out without, impu you know, with impunity. They, they were never penalized for it. But everybody knew who the, who the puppets were talking about. But and it was, okay, but, uh, and yeah, I understand was, you're talking about an overall performance situation, but do you know what the puppets specifically look like? Yes. Um, actually, we can pull up an image from one of the puppets in the exhibition. If um, this is what this is one example of a puppet, and it, you can see she's um, carved out of wood and clothed in fabric, and this is just one piece of a puppet. You could see this puppet, for example, mounted on a person's head, and the person would be completely enclosed in fabric, and that way they could they could perform and be seen outdoors in public because. Traditional African puppetry was outdoors. It wasn't inside of a, a, a clean theater. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I wanted to I wanted to jump back to this uh, other question of uh, you know whether African American puppeteers tend to use um, sorry tend to do more representation of the human form. And I think that you know if the answer is yes that we do. I think a large part of it is probably about this, you know, moment or these constant moments of taking back our own identities, right? Because mm -hmm. the black body has been performed so many times and has served as, uh, you know, sort of this performance object of sorts uh, mm -hmm. that it is now, you know, incumbent upon like black puppeteers to um, definitely tell our story and, uh, you know, create more art and culture that speaks to, you know, sort of the black, uh, the black story, black people, humanity, uh, black joy, um, the importance of black lives. Mm -hmm. So I can see where a lot of black puppeteers might not really want to venture into uh, some other, maybe like more esoteric territory or something when we have work to do on culture mm -hmm. with our own, you know, with our own image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to chime in here and um, yeah, if is my mic behaving properly, you can hear me. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to you because this is your expertise. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So we've called this uh, panel the Renaissance of African American puppetry, but actually this is the first fluorescence because a figure like the African figure that Schroeder just showed, um, people were severely punished for attempting to create something like that under slavery. Um, those objects in their traditional context were very often associated with spiritual practices which in the United States were viewed as heathen idolatry or worse, devil worship. So making those types of figures was strongly discouraged. <laughs> um, and then emerging from slavery, having the leisure time and um, the materials and the training to create puppets and put on a puppet show um, was something that was difficult for people to access, um, except maybe in the educational context where you could justify investing your slim resources in something like puppets. So it's really only after World War II that we start to see African-Americans um, making careers as puppeteers who are entertainers. And I think um, in the present moment, we may um, have a focus on human figures for the reasons that Amwar so aptly described, but there's no telling where this is going to go as more people enter the field with their own creative vision. Exactly. And, you know, a nice little segue, you know, um, Shorter, you were showing us uh, the puppet um, before and um, uh, Paulette, you mentioned about how people were were um, punished for even showing a puppet like that. Uh, our next question is about um, what actually defies a beautiful puppet. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, what we just saw is would that be considered beautiful? Or would it be uh, grotesque? Like, uh, would mm -hmm. be, people be offended? Is that why they were punished um, mm -hmm. for not um, creating those puppets? or was it more the separation of their culture, their African culture? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's largely separation of culture. Remember, um, whenever African people were imported to America, they were stripped of all culture and, and forcibly um, not allowed to speak their own languages. So puppetry deals with language and it deals with object making. They were not allowed to do that on their own. Mm -hmm. And also um, in the, U.S., we are used to solo puppeteers who, say, make a living doing school shows by throwing their puppets in their vehicle and driving around different places. But um, as Schroeder described earlier, puppetry in Africa existed in a whole social context. And so in order to organize something that Africans would have recognized as an object performance, you had to have the whole community involved. And developing that level of networking and social capital would have been the worst nightmare of the slaveholders because if you can organize a puppet masquerade, then you could organize a revolt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, was it was certainly a gathering. But you asked about <laughs> what, what makes a beautiful puppet. And in the, mm -hmm. in the puppetry world, um, beautiful is not just based on skin deep beauty. <laughs> it, really, it really talks about how well a puppet actually moves. Mm -hmm. A beautiful puppet is a puppet that moves very well. Um, when you talk about aesthetics, I've had some challenges with some of my puppets who were not who were not perceived as pretty, or they didn't follow what I call the the Disney formula. I'm um, giving mm -hmm. Miss Lily. Yes. Um, Miss Lily is a puppet who is actually a she's a docent. She actually works in museums and she gives tours to adults. She does not work well with children. She doesn't do children well at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, really, she doesn't do children. Um, but she, when she's in action, she's very effective with an, a live audience. However, I've gotten feedback from people who online who've seen her um, perform and basically said, this is an ugly puppet. <laughs> now, granted, she's, she's got some heavy packed on makeup, but in theater, <laughs> You have to you have to be exaggerated anyway to be able to be seen yeah. on stage. It's when people look up close and see, oh my God, the woman's got huge lips and and bright cheeks and blue eyeshadow. Where does that come from? 
they're using another standard in terms of, of um, what she looks like. Can we bring up the slide with the three puppets? Is it also Schroeder, um, people's perspective of her skin color? That, al that also plays in, yeah, that also plays, you know, um, Americans have really deep issues about beauty and skin color. So I, we don't, we yeah. can have a whole panel on that. <laughs> exactly, that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But that, that's actually one of the reasons that my, my puppets also have different skin tones. Um, here we see DeAndre, Mr. Zeke in the middle, and Smooth Earl on the side. Um, and my puppets tend to be human figures. I don't do a lot of fuzzy animal characters. I do mostly, mostly people. And I'm finding some very interesting in interaction with audiences when they see them. When I'm performing with kids, for example, in a large auditorium, when the first puppet shows up, there's this roaring laughter. And I'm not quite sure what that comes from, but one of my colleagues said, they're really uncomfortable because many of them have never seen a black puppet. So their response first is to laugh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, another, th another thing about puppets and aesthetics is that um, puppets lend themselves very well to the grotesque. And so Schroeder, your puppets, can people hear me? Cause I, I don't see, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, here, yeah, here. yeah. Good. Schroeder, your puppets um, are working in a kind of grotesque, but a grotesque that counters the grotesque way in which African-Americans have been caricatured. And that's a kind of a fine line to walk, but you do pull that off. You do. So my question to all of you, um, Anwar, if you can start, is how important is it um, for African Americans to um, create, build, uh, perform, okay, manipulate black puppets? And we're talking in human form. We're talking human form. Got it. Um, um, I think it's wildly important. Uh, more so than any other art form that I've engaged in. Uh, puppetry just has this power and this magic uh, where, uh, you know, puppeteers get to sort of embody these imagined spaces. And I think that that is the practice that's necessary for, you know, moving Black culture and Black community forward is you know, practicing who it is that we want to be, mm -hmm. um, how we want to define, how we want to like see ourselves. And that there's, you know, I, you know, earlier today, I was looking at some sculptures by uh, contemporary artists, uh, Shanique Smith and Shakaya Booker, and they make these, you know, um, tires that are wrapped into these giant knots and these like collections of clothes that are like these big bundles. And I thought to myself, you know, after speaking with everyone yesterday, like, what if those were activated, right? Mm. They're made from the materials that are of our, you know, so many of our lives, this, these discarded objects and things. And what if those are activated and how much power um, that might have? And so I think whether we're talking traditional puppets or, uh, you know, some other type of, you know, whether it's masks, I think that this type of education uh, and performance is is necessary and it's, and it's beautiful and it's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Shroda, would you like to add to that? I, th I think he covered it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. You know, I, while you were saying, uh, talking and while I was thinking about um, Tarish uh, Jagedo Pipkins and um, the one thing uh, that he shared with me is when he does his performances, um, he does it with his son and how people even come to him and comment, not necessarily about his, you know, his puppets themselves, but the fact that as an African-American, you know, father being there with his son, doing something, okay, together with the son, sharing an art, passing it down, that the people were more impressed and, and, and touched by that even more so than 
his puppets and he of course he has these absolutely wonderful puppets so um I, I think uh, what do you think about the importance go ahead Schroeder. i think i think whenever we see an example of something being passed on is really impressive in our exhibit we had dirk joseph with his daughters mm -hmm. performing yes. and they're out of maryland and whenever they show up uh it's a love fest people just love seeing the adult particularly an african-american father uh dealing with his kids and passing on puppetry yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so let us move on to our next question. Um, how, to, since we're talking about African-American puppetry in our society, you know, in our country here, so how is contemporary African-American puppeteers, which you all, we all are, um, addressing Black lives and stereotypes in today's society? Since, you know, Anwar, you mentioned before about it's so important for African Americans to even have African puppets. I mean, as far as it's just important for us to get out there, right? To be out there and to be invited to the table, but also um, showing, you know, our art forms. So, um, Anwar, can you start? Sure. Um... I think, you know, my, my practice is, you know, is this, I love working in collage, right? We were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, the aesthetics earlier. And for me, uh, when I think of sort of like a black aesthetic, uh, I, the first artist that comes to mind is a uh, photographer and collage artist, Romar Bearden, or maybe it's Romare Bearden, not 100% sure. Romar. My, my apologies, Romar. Romar. Thank you. And, you know, it's the collage that allows him to capture the complexity of individuals and communities in these two-dimensional objects, right? And so part of what I hope to do when, you know, I'm working with youth or running any type of workshop and just like the puppets that I make is to complexify the object, you know, for one, and then also put them into um, stories, scenarios, situations that, uh, you know, one, young people can relate to, but also that young people can contribute to. Uh, I kind of mm -hmm. think of myself doing a workshop as sort of like a Mad Lib of sorts, where there are all of these spaces that need to be filled with uh, youth words and the puppets that they create. Um, and, the aesthetic that I go for, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a, a puppet here, um, you know, kind of back to that grotesque thing when for, we said before, but, uh, you know, I made this, uh, I made this puppet and it's just out of uh, photographs of me and a young lady at the workshop said, I don't want to play with your creepy faces. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so then I thought, oh, well, it's sort of, you know, it's kind of creepy, perhaps that's similar to grotesque, but then also, you know, I explained to the youth like why we were using this technique. And you know what, to allow them, uh, give them permission to um, manipulate my identity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, that's a, it's a safe space for me. And what we're trying to do is create safe spaces for people to, uh, you know, uh, define themselves. And, you know, I think that this puppetry is always, again, a practice. Um, and when we rehearse, you know, for certain scenarios, then when those scenarios arrive, we are better prepared. Or we've already started telling the story. And now we're just following our own narratives. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. Anwar, you, you, work, you work with um, student, students in a juvenile detention. How has um, this, uh, this strategy, this, this way of art affect those students? I would say that, you know, I've worked with students in uh, detention for almost 10 years. And a few of the strategies, uh, well, one strategy is using puppetry as the art form that I'm bringing. So that first and foremost um, has been crucial to the gains that I feel like I'm uh, getting in my ability to connect with youth quickly run them through like a process that they like are enjoying you know i want to like lower the barrier to entry for people to jump into art projects um and and one of the things you know i, I mentioned once before 
but the vulnerability that it takes to be a puppeteer, uh, mm -hmm. the vulnerability that it takes to be a grown, you know, 43 year old black man amongst these black teens playing, you know, playing a puppet, not playing with a puppet, but playing a puppet, you know? <laughs> I guess I play not with them as well. Not at all. Not playing you're working, with dolls, right? You're working the puppet. It's working. <laughs> you're working and, the uh, and you well, you know what? When you are invested in working the puppet, then the puppet works for you. Right? Mm. It works for me. It works for those kids. Fantastic. And yes. you know, that's uh I need my goal really is to take those 90 minute sessions and make them like really turn the whole thing into an experience. You know, like we were kind of talking about like African culture and the, you know, the experience that is like puppetry there. I want to turn it into an experience. Um, mm. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep working. And I am, I am blessed to have found puppetry and have to have found all of you, uh, you know, mentors to help me like get this right. So we can like try to like change, turn this world around. Good work. Pull it. Mm -hmm. yeah, bravo. Fantastic. Pull it. Um, you know, you, you work with animatronics and um, mm -hmm. with STEM, STEAM. Can you speak a little bit on that and how you worked with children there in Atlanta? Okay. Um, so I haven't been doing that over like the last year or two because I've been focused on these exhibits and the research. But um, mm -hmm. I am committed to doing the STEAM work because if you remember, there's an old Richard Pryor routine where he says, he was referring to a Blade Runner, I think. He says, I hate when white folks make a movie about the future and there don't be no black people in it because it means they're not planning for us to be there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> planning for us to be part of creating these new technologies. And I think particularly that we need to be there in the field of robotics because we already know what it is to be commodified labor. And that's what a robot is, a commodity object that performs labor. So when we're dealing with the ethical questions of how robotics is a part of our society, we have a perspective to bring to that discussion that needs to be there. And so I want to inspire youth to get involved in this field um, instead of, you know, the technology being made the way that the infamous HP face tracking software was made uh, without any input from people uh, with darker complexions. And so when they launch it into the public, it can't see us. <laughs> That's profound. And, yeah. <laughs> And uh, Schroeder, you, met, you mentioned that uh, Miss Linian does not like children, <laughs> okay. not deal with children, but um, can you share some experience um, that you have with children or, you know, or even, I don't know if it's even the same thing of um, her being a docent and children are, you, you're doing a tour with children, right? Do you do tours with children? Or you've she, never no. done a tour. No, she does. In fact, in fact, it, we're we were very clear about that. In the museum. at the time, I happened to be a, a museum director of of education, and I wanted to create a safe space for adults to play. <laughs> Thought a, a puppet would be a great venue for that, um, or a vehicle for that. So we were very clear in all of our programming marketing. This is for adults only, not for children. There were a couple of times when someone showed up with a genius four-year-old and um, was insistent that the child could understand the tour. And when I'm performing, I'm in all black, but you can see me and I'm performing with puppet. Miss Lily starts off and tells you that I'm not to be addressed. I'm the technician. She's handling the tour. The tour is for adults. And would you please take your child next door? There's a wonderful family workshop for children, but she's not a <laughs> age for this tour. So Ms. Lily actually talks to the parent and says, no, darling, please take <laughs> <laughs> But But that was a particular situation. Now, I do have other puppets that are really child friendly. Um, uh, Ms. Lily's just not one of them. Mm -hmm. I've, what so I've been experimenting, go ahead. Yeah. Please, yeah, I was going to say, you know, you at the, what is your experience at uh, with the people on tour um, 
or who visit the the museums, you know, especially museum, I, uh, the uh, Smithsonian. I know you're at the new African American Museum in Washington D.C. So, um, what are the reactions uh, to her? And you know, share with some of that, please. Once they once they get past that point of suspension of disbelief, they really forget that they're talking to a puppet. Um, yeah, the puppet actually becomes the character for that 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 learning environment for adults. The I think the the most uh, the most um, the most rewarding comment I've gotten was from a woman who approached me. This is a this is a white woman. Um, she was very well coiffed, was tall. She came to me after after a tour with Miss Lily, and she said, "I'm I've been divorced for twelve years, and I didn't know where this conversation was going to go." But she said, "I've been divorced for twelve years. I want you to know that this is the first time I have actually laughed in twelve years." Wow. So th th this is it goes back to what Arnold was talking about that that whole magic um, yes. that puppet, that a puppet actually creates for you in the environment, and people let down all let down their defenses when they're dealing with a puppet. Yes, yes, and I, I found that even um, with the puppetry that I do, um, even in church, that um, yeah, people are, are very uh, yeah, they're, they they come to, and tell me, oh, uh, it it brings out the child in me. There was even one time I was performing out in in a park and uh, just just doing a song manipulation, you know, simple song, and the woman came up to me after and said. You know, this, the, the puppet, it wasn't even about the song. It was the puppet that I was manipulating. It reminded her of a doll that she had as a child. And she felt that God was healing the, the hurting child inside of her. Can we, pull up, the, can we that, pull up the image of your puppet? Pull up the image of your puppet. <laughs> we, have a sh we have a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and so that was actually that moment when I realized that puppetry wasn't, was, it was more than just entertainment, it was and fun, that it really can change a person's life. And with Sister Edwina here, who is named after my late mom, um, I designed this puppet uh, because I grew up in church. I'm a church girl, my, my, my grandfather was a bishop in our church organization, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, I was the kid that, you know, we were there all day, Black Pentecostal churches. So you're there, you know, pretty much all day long, hanging out, roll, you know, running all over under the benches, you know, <laughs> and everything. So, um, you know, I, I created this puppet because um, she represents uh, that part of African American culture, that foundation that is the Black church. And um, the reason why she's so dressed up, even though now, uh, uh, in society, it's okay to be very casual in, 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 in churches, even in black churches. But, you know, there was a time where you had to dress up for church because the, the whole um, belief and concept was that you were going to church to be before God, before the king. So you need to put on your best. You're going okay, to the to house of the you. Lord. <laughs> yeah, you're going, present yourself. you're going to the throne, okay? So you're going to present yourself in the best way, which was what's happening, you know, it happened in the Bible with Esther when she went to go see the king. She had to, you know, it was like months of her getting dressed up just for yeah, one but, night. But talking, <laughs> talking about talking about churches, there is a, a movement of puppetry in churches, particularly mm -hmm. black churches, um, where you have. Yes. It, they're usually in choirs in black churches, I think. But you have <laughs> you have these. I'm seeing this across the country. You've got these troops of of, of youth people who are performing puppets and they're usually doing gospel songs. I've had troops for years, absolutely. And um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful way to, you know, not everybody wants to hear just a regular sermon. It's just fun to <laughs> present the gospel, gospel truths and, and parables in a fun, entertaining way. And um, I, I just want to step one, one step back with, with Sister Edwina and my experience, even with her on exhibit um, uh, up in Connecticut, as well as down in Fort Lauderdale, that people, whenever they see her, they go, wow, this reminds me of my grandmother when I was little. And I, you know, used to go to church. My grandmother had the candies in her, the hard candies in her purse, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and they start you know, reminiscing about this wonderful time in their hard life. Hard candies, and yeah. Candy, you know, hard candies out of hard the purse. Butterscotch. And, 
<laughs> butterscotch. <laughs> <laughs> and the strawberry one too, right guys? The little strawberries. And one woman said, she goes, hmm, you know, I should go back to church. And I was like, Ooh. my job is done, right? Drop the, <laughs> drop the mic, my job is done here. So, um, you know, but it's, uh, you know, going back to even what we said before about the magic of puppetry, right? And what it does, but yes, um, it, it, how it affects uh, uh, society. And yes, there there are, are troops of people, individuals, and they 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 function mostly in the traditional hand rod puppet. Okay, but it is expanding. Out to talking other talking about puppetry, puppetry and and effect on society, I'd like to share a short clip. Um, during the COVID yes. period, when we're all in lockdown, I've been experimenting with a cell phone in one hand and a puppet in the other, just trying to do short clips. And I thought it was important to address voting. Can we see the the clip on voting? I wanted to address the importance of young people um, getting involved with the vote. Hi, I'm Cordell, and today I want to talk about, hey Cordell! Yeah, we're making a video here, Smooth Earl. You gonna talk about voting? Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Smooth. We need to talk about DeAndre and get him to vote. Is DeAndre 18? He should be 18. His feet are big enough to be 18. You see those feet? DeAndre. Yeah. Are you 18? No. Will you be 18 by November 3rd? Yeah, I'll be 18 by November 3rd. Good. Then you can vote in the presidential election. Make sure you register so you can vote. Okay. I thought he had to be close to 18 if he wasn't already 18. That's a good thing. He's going to be 18 by November 3rd, so he can vote. He needs to vote. He's always talking about who should be president, who should be vice president, what we need to do about climate change, what we need to do about gun control and violence in the schools. Yeah, that young boy needs to vote. That'll be smooth. I bet I know who he's going to vote for for vice president. He wants to impress that young girl he's been hanging around with. Now, she's a clever one. <sighs> That's just my opinion. That's my girl. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the for the real, so the real videographers. I do apologize. I am literally holding a, a phone in one hand and a puppet in the other. Um, so that's my early attempt during COVID. Love it. But, but you know what? It's it's so powerful because um, it's just these short clips to to keep. It, it just kept uh, captures people, you know. And that's the power of puppetry. That you know, if it was just you, Schroeder, or somebody else who said, "Go out there and please vote," it's like, yeah, mm, but it's just gonna, it's gonna cause somebody to stop and to focus and to listen, yeah. no matter what age they are. You know, it, it, it could be a kid saying, "Hey, you know, if, if you're 18, you should vote," telling their older sister, or brother, or parent, um, you know, or be it is the, you know, that adult going, "Okay, I'm understanding. This is what I need to do." So uh -huh. it's it's amazing. Amazing. Um, so what about the Black Arts Movement? Okay, let's talk about a little bit about the Black Arts Movement um, and the Black Lives Matter. Do you think it's important for us as puppeteers to, especially as African-American puppeteers, to have a say into what's going, going on? Should, should we uh, uh, even talk about the talk and you guys know what i mean by the talk of the um african-american parent telling their especially you know young black male son how to um uh, uh deal with and behave um you know in a positive way in front of a police officer or when they encounter a police officer so how how do you how do you feel um um should we be part of this? Uh, should we out, be out there marching? How would we? How should we be part 
of what's happening now in society? Because you know our country is so divided right now. What can we do as puppeteers? Paulette? Okay. Um, well, I, I'll say what I'm doing. Um, my research, you know, we talked earlier about the suppression of African object performance. And I've always looked at that as a kind of psychic amputation. So this is a wound in the self-image and ultimately the self-esteem of people of African descent in the Americas. Uh, in the puppetry scholarship, however, there is a hole the size and shape of the Black Atlantic. Uh, the catalog, which we are celebrating today, the Living Objects Catalog, is an initial effort in beginning to fill that gap. Um, and the work that I've been doing with the Living Objects exhibit and the one I'm currently planning for the Center for Puppetry Arts, as well as the articles I'm starting to publish and the book that I'm working on are all geared towards filling that hole, healing that psychic amputation wound um, so that we can reclaim that way of defining and representing our own identities as well as the others that are available. Fantastic. And Schroeder, I, um, you know, we saw what you did. Do you have another one to share with us? Um, uh, yes. And, and actually, this was, this was actually something that came up during COVID. Um, can we bring up the clip, disinfectants? Don't drink disinfectants. Hi, I'm Cordell, and I want to talk about the corona and disinfectants. <laughs> Hey, Cordell. Yeah. Which one of these disinfectants is best for the corona, man? <laughs> Smooth Earl. Yeah. Do not drink a disinfectant for the corona. Don't do it. Do not drink a disinfectant to cure anything. I don't care who makes the suggestion. Stay healthy. I love his voice. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, those are, again, those are um, things that, that came out of the COVID period when I'm like stuck home alone thinking, okay, how can the puppets respond to something that's current? And when that announcement was made on the television, I thought, oh, this, this has to stop. I was told by a friend who is in the medical field, there were people who were considering drinking disinfectant. Mm. Mm. My goodness. My goodness. And Anwar, are you up to something new? Um, Absolutely. Or impacting society? <laughs> oh, trying to, uh, perhaps. So, you know, we uh, yesterday during our uh, sort of our, our run through, we talked a little bit about the idea of Afrofuturism, right? And then I think Schroeder, I think it was your point. You're like, well, it's uh, something along the lines of, it's like black people like that look like they're all like sci-fi out, right? You know, and is that the definition of, is that like what Afrofuturism is? And so I think it's sort of interesting that there is um, an aesthetic that is sort of Afrofuturist, uh, Black Panther perhaps, uh, or, you know, if you go to Instagram, um, you can find lots of, you know, sort of black cosplay people and illustrations of like black people sort of in this Sun Ra space future. Um, right. <laughs> but, you know, I have this book here. It's called Afrofuturism by mm -hmm. uh, Natasha Womack. And it's broken down into you know, conversations about visual art or conversations about um, comics and that type of thing. And then the last chapter actually is about uh, sort of the way forward or agent change the chapter is called. And I just want to read this one, this one bit here. And it just says, there are so many activists who look to Afrofuturism and the canon of literature and theories as a platform for social change and the stoking of the imagination. Um, and so I think that is, you know, my ultimate goal is this stoking of imagination. And you know, yesterday, after we met yesterday, I thought to myself, well, 
what would it look like if I made, what does, it, what does an Afrofuturistic puppet look like? And so using the things in my apartment, I came up with this. And mind, mind you, I'm the studio, but in, in my apartment. And so, right, it is made, <laughs> it has like, it has like a kente cloth skin, right? I have kente cloth skin, right? Um, you know, but I also, and so the part that makes it sort of Afrofuturistic is that when you open his mouth all of the way, right, there is this little space man inside, right? <laughs> and the whole idea is that, you know, in deep inside of you, there is something different than is perhaps like projected. And so I think, you know, I would love to explore storylines uh, in that vein. Uh, I made, I couldn't stop making puppets, right? But look what you did. We just talked for a couple hours. And I spent the next like eight hours just making puppets. But then I also, you know, thought of this puppet that this young lady had a problem with. And, you know, it's a self portrait. And he wants to explore this colorful multiverse in the uh, in the background. It's a rip in the space time continuum <laughs> where uh, where all of my dreams come true. All of my dreams become realities, and my current reality is just a bad dream. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know he'll go off into outer space and then meet a guy who's just like wait wait. Where are my eyes? <laughs> and I go, you know, uh, I get in his eyes. Wait, I still can't see. And I go, well, let me fix that for you. <laughs> no, these are the wrong eyes. The wrong eyes. Get my other eyes. <laughs> those? No, not those, <laughs> you fool. <laughs> Ah, there we go. <laughs> now I can see you. Can you see me? Ah, <laughs> uh, so, great. You know, I, I don't know, uh, but you know, I think, but like this type of thing is interesting to me with like the black figure on one side and another ca uh, character, whether it's an opposing character, uh, someone that's in like, you know, a conversation with, or whether it's just, the other side of who you are and then how mm. can you be manipulated or how can you manipulate yourself how can you create you know how can you create some change um and so i think i'm interested in you know taking the the building aspect of puppetry and you know ma making it educational as it is but then also just trying to like integrate all of these sort of ideas about, um, you know, defining yourself. And uh, I don't know, you all have been on Zooms with me before, you know that this is like the nicest my place has ever looked. So <laughs> if you've gotten me to like make this nice, now I'm gonna like start performing here a little more often. So, well, you just, you've just you. given us an example of a beautiful puppet, Anwar. <laughs> Ah. Oh, thank you. It's a beautiful <laughs> puppet because of the way you're able to manipulate it and you have it all in tune looking at how you attach the eyes. That's an example of manipulation. Mm -hmm. But I, I love that you can sit there and use your puppets, um, yet again, talking about society, um, even in the form of puppet therapy of, of you know, asking people, or children, whoever your, your um, participants are, builders are, you know, of how, um, uh, you know, how are you perceiving yourself, you know, when you're talking about eyes and stuff. And um, I mean, it seems like your, you know, degree, your psychology degree from Harvard, your, you know, arts degree is just coming together so beautifully, you know, in the art of puppetry. It's just, it's, you know, it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, you know, it's yeah, just it's absolutely yeah. funny. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of funny, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> there is, um, you know, how do you guys, um, you know, puppetry has been used for, you know, um, in society to deliver very profound messages, right? Really strong messages, but in a lighthearted, you know, fun kind of way. Um, can you give me some examples or what do you, any opinions about that, guys? 
that on me. Okay. Um, so, so earlier we were talking about this renaissance or this uh, new development of African American puppetry, and I situated the beginning of professional African American puppeteers mainly after World War II. And in particular, it's interesting that it was ventriloquists who were working on what's called the Chitlin circuit, that's black clubs, um, doing comedy, who were some of the first ones to um, put an authentic African American voice into puppetry. And we do have one example in our slide deck, if you would pull up uh, Richard Sandfield, please. So some people may be old enough to remember these records. Uh, Richard and Willie uh, recorded Nasty and Naughty on the same label as Rudy Ray Moore. And then uh, they also did a collaboration with Richard Pryor. Is that the next album? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a tradition of using puppets with the humor. Um, is this a good place to put in the other example that I found in recent weeks? Or do we want to put that yeah. for later? OK, so I'm also going um, to signal um, an artist who's been using this time during the COVID to crank out videos on YouTube um, and is drawing a following. He is a stand up comedian. And the premise of his web series is that Tremo, the comedian, is in a relationship with Keisha Jones, who is the puppet. And so let's just see what he's doing here. Thank you for calling Cash Money Taxes, where we get your refund back for the 992000s. This is Keisha Jones speaking. How may I help you? Keisha. Who is this? Oh, so you don't recognize Willie Boys no more, huh? Willie, how the hell you get this number? This my first day at the job. <laughs> Come on now, Keisha. You know Willie. Willie was sauce for now. You know Willie. Willie gonna make a way. Willie gonna make a way. Willie, what do you want? Keish, Willie, Willie just calling to wish his girl a happy Valentine's Day now. You ain't gotta... Come on now, can Willie do that? Valentine's Day was last week. Bye. I know, I know it was last week, Keish, but they had Willie down there in the hole. You know, I was in the isolation. Me and one of the inmates got into a little altercation. He called this up touching my noodles, okay? Now, we both know Willie noodles not for play play, Keish. Don't touch, no, don't, don't touch another man commissary now, Keish. You know that. That's nothing jailhouse rules. And so he did what he did, so Willie had to do what he had to do. But I'm calling my girl Nato. Let her know I was thinking about her while I was in the hole. You know? No, I don't know, Willie. And I'm not trying to hit no more of these oranges, the new black jailhouse stories you telling. Now, bye. Keith, hold up. Willie got to tell you something now. Now, what do you want? Keith, hold up. Now, Willie needs you to put some money on his books now. I'm down to my last two moon pies. So Willie, 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 Willie needs some more commissary. Willie, I'm not about to put no money on your books. Now, bye. Oh, so it's like that? Yeah, it's like that. Okay, okay. You remember, you remember our first Valentine's Day? Huh? You remember our first Valentine's Day where I took you to the New Orleans? Yeah, I took you down there to the New Orleans to see the Isley Brothers. Now, Keisha, you remember that, right? You remember that? Yeah, I remember that. But what that guy You remember what the Isley Brothers said, Keisha? You remember your favorite song? How it go? Drifting on a memory Ain't no place I'd rather be than with you while <laughs> loving you wow 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 I wanna be living for the love of you oh yes I am and all that I'm giving for the love of you Oh, yeah, baby. Okay, okay. How much you need me to put on your books? Will it need about $200, Keish? You can send that? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, call my sister Tatiana and, and, and give it to her. She know how to get it to Willie now. Okay. All right, girl, love you. Grammarly. Wow. <laughs> So many issues caught up in that clip. <laughs> oh my God. I can't even speak about it. <laughs> but you know, I, I I hope that people can, you know, if certain people are like that, they kind of see themselves 
Um, and I'm sure that, you know, to help laugh at themselves, but also like, okay, maybe, I don't know, maybe think about some of the situations that they're in. But that's one, of the th that's one of the things that puppetry does. It, it, it allows you to address sensitive, sensitive issues and sometimes be able to laugh at situations that you probably wouldn't want to laugh at in a real, in a real life situation. But they can bring some humor to it. Exactly, exactly. I think, Fantastic. you know, I feel like it's just a conversation about the, the, the dominant narrative and who is, you know, who is the, what is the vision of a black person that most people sort of believe is true. And we Sorry, need, no. you know, we need, we just need more storytellers making sure that we are complexifying our identities and, you know, showing like the, the, the men who are fathers and showing, you know, the resilience, right? And kind of pushing us towards uh, uh, looking forward and a liberation. I think that there's something great about addressing and looking at the past. And a lot of people make art about where we are, you know, but like, where are we going? And so I think that's, uh, I feel like that's kind of a challenge that I think uh, anyone should take up, but certainly black artists and, uh, and black puppeteers. Because if it's a Renaissance, right, it's, it's because we are like, because we're pushing. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully doing something different. And this is not unlike what you see in other forms of entertainment, say films or even in drama or literature. How do you represent a culture or um, multiple cultures within a, a certain sphere? There's no one way to go about doing it. So I think if you're just focusing on puppetry, we need to allow these people to explore vast landscapes. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I had the... Um, Honor John Bell invited me to be, John and Trudy invited me to be part of the Toy Theater Festival. And um, I felt I needed to do something about this, um, the whole movement to be part of it as an artist. And uh, I used Ashley Bryant, who I think is, what is he about? Somewhere in his nineties right now. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. his, his wonderful book called Beautiful Blackbird. And it, it it, it's mixed with, um, you know, with a uh, wonderful African culture of these birds in Africa who um, the, the blackbird, it was the only bird, it was, it was just a blackbird and they, they were colorful, but they didn't have any stripes. There were only one color and how they admired the blackbird. They want, you know, they wanted to be like him. And, you know, he says, well, you can look like me, but you know, you're not me. You don't have my, my internal characteristics, you know, to, to be me, you want to be me, but it's got to be inside and out. And just the book, you know, he does share his black, you know, his stripes. And that's why birds today, you know, are multicolored. Um, but then the end of the story is black is beautiful. Black is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, just with this whole Black Lives Matter, uh, like I said, I am not um, physically out there marching at this moment, but, you know, I still wanted to share with the, the society, with community that, you know, we are beautiful. Our puppets are beautiful. Miss Lillian is beautiful, <laughs> mm. you know, um, and everything. Um, did we want to talk a little bit about hip hop culture before we start ask, uh, answering some questions? How is uh, puppetry affecting hip hop culture or vice versa? Sure. Well, you know, uh, we talked about uh, Terrace Jigato Pipkin, Pipkins earlier, and, you know, he did make some of the, the puppets on um, Missy Elliott and Pharrell's uh, WTF uh, video. And, yes. you know, but I think in terms of hip hop culture, the next biggest uh, or most popular sort of puppet experience would be Chance the Rapper. And he has that song called, well, first of all, on his national tour, he had a whole, he had a whole choir of puppets, you know, and then the song is called Same Drugs. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that none, and it's a beautiful song and it's, uh, you know, it's a love song. Um, 
I looked up like all of the puppeteers and the companies that they, you know, uh, look to to create these massive productions. And there may be African American uh, puppeteers like working at some of these shops, but they certainly weren't, uh, you know, African American puppeteers weren't at the helm. And, uh, you know, and it's, I think that's just a matter of scale, right? And, uh, you know, taking something that is, you know, relatively small and, um, you know, being able to, you know, build it up and create like employment opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. I ran into a, yeah. I ran into one of the senators from Wisconsin when I was painting a Black Lives Matter mural. And she said, tell me about your art. And I said, well, this is about the art, but I said, but what I'm really interested in is workforce development, mm -hmm. right? And art is just like that vehicle and puppetry, right? Puppetry is more that vehicle. I'm not trying to teach kids how to make paintings because everyone's going to hang paintings on the wall. Like that's not, that's, no one wants that. <laughs> um, but what people do want is like quality entertainment and, and, and storytelling. And so um, you know, a one person puppet show works great, but you can do a lot more when you've got more people working with you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, part of our little subtext that we have um, for this forum is a puppeteer's journey of being part of a movement of rediscovering the art of puppetry and it's it discovering us. So do you guys really think this is a movement? Is this something, do you think it's, it's a phase that we're just going through just because Black Lives Matter is at the forefront right now? Or is this something that will truly be long lasting? And like you said, you know, will we be invited to be employed as African-American puppeteers? I'm not sure. That, I'm not sure that I could attribute a puppetry movement to Black Lives Matter. As you, if you think about it, we did the African American puppetry exhibit a couple of years ago. That was before Black Lives Matter became the tag that it is now. If anything, we're we're focusing on it. We're noticing that there are people working in the field of puppetry. Um, movements tend to gather momentum when people spread the word and people are engaged with it. And maybe that's what we're seeing now because there's even through technology, people have access to puppetry or even making puppetry. So you don't have to be someone who apprenticed to a puppet master for a period of time right now. You can actually go on YouTube and figure out how to make a puppet. And more people are doing this. Yeah, okay. yeah, Paulette? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that the emergence of African-American puppetry is a function of an ongoing movement. Um, first of all, in the theater world, we've been doing this Black Lives Matter since um, the production of Rachel, which was an anti-lynching play produced by the NAACP in 1916. So that's been the conversation in theater from a the last hundred years. Uh, but if you look in this panel, we have two doctorates and a stack of master's degrees between us. And, and so um, being in a position where we have this many African-Americans who have had access to education and resources, and um, even though our families may have said, you should just get a good job at the post office, that we're willing to take the risk of working in this field, that is a function of the ongoing push for access to education and education and um, economic opportunities. And I think, you know, I see a little question down here about scaling black business. And one of the reasons that I wanted to put Trey Moe's video in here is be because he's an example of an entrepreneur. He's working with uh, maybe a cell phone camera. I don't know what kind of camera he's using and a puppet and whatever's in his house and I've heard him speak in another forum um, talking about how building a following on YouTube enabled him to start booking comedy gigs. So mm. that before the pandemic, he was actually touring and starting to get some notice in that way. Um, later during the pandemic, he made a deal with Apple and Eve, which sells sex toys. 
And so there are a couple of videos on there um, that are actually promotions for sex toys. <laughs> so he definitely has a business vision as well as the artistic vision. And I think that as far as scaling our business, that at this time is only limited by our own imaginations. So we come back to that because we have tools before us that were never available to us before. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. All right, so let's move to the Q&A segment um, as we're starting to draw a close to this fantastic hour. We can be on here for hours, right guys? We can talk about this forever and more, right? Um, so Connie Burke Mulligan uh, asked how, and each, anyone chime in to answer the question, please. Uh, how do traditional African masks play a part in puppetry as in the dance you described, Schroeder? They're, um, Matt. The, they're, puppetry is an extension of that whole performance. So masks could be the top of a costume and the, the person is completely in, um, enclosed in fabric and they're performing. So there's a, there's a direct link between the mask, the performance, the dance, the puppet. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Ann Shepard, I'm sorry, Sheffield uh, asks, are the puppet shows influenced by African-American artists? Uh, Sh Shorta, I can bring, uh, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm not quite sure what that was part of, I'm sorry. Uh, so are the puppet shows influenced by African-American artists? Do well, you there was possibly- There was a show a that, um, was produced at the Center for Puppetry Arts that was based on Romare or Romare Bearden's collages. And that was not um, built or performed, shall we say, by African-Americans, but that's one example. And I'm sure there are others. Thank you. Probably, uh, Frank we should keep in mind that puppetry in America is still considered a, a kid or childlike form. You mm -hmm. have to break out of that box, first of all, for, for artists to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And um, in Frank, oh, oh, I'm sorry, continue, I'm sorry. Yeah, in the Living Objects exhibit, we also had a mask that was created by Faith Ringgold, a well-known visual artist, um, but it was a piece that she had used in performance art. So there are um, a number of artists. Another one would be Nick Cave and his sound suits uh, who work in that vein. Maybe that answers the question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so Frank um, Prochant says, do you see a continuity between the identity of puppeteer slash edu educator for African-Americans and the strong child rearing and educational function of puppetry in Africa. Wow, big question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, well, you want to take it on where? Well, I'll, I'll say I'll say this much, and this is uh, you know something that I've experienced over the years that my personal dedication to community is strong, is so strong and so embedded in ways that some of my sort of non-Black or non-POC uh, friends, you know, don't necessarily connect with. Uh, you know, uh, so I've heard that I don't have a responsibility as an African-American artist to make art about Blackness. Um, and right, that's the liberation that all black people and black artists are looking for that like everything else is fine that i can though go spend time making work about these other ideas right but we're still trying to uh you know we're still trying to like just get back to healthy you know um so i can't remember exactly what the question was i'm sorry okay. i digress <laughs> okay okay well i will um say that Despite the prohibition on the figurative objects, the slaveholders were not able to stamp out the story cycles that were part of that African educational process. So we have Br'er Rabbit, we have Anansi. And um, I think when African-Americans 
pick up puppets and start trying to serve the community as educators, we automatically fall back on those stories as part of the process. So I would say there is a connection there. Thank you. Uh, Ramona Moore asks, um, are there any African-American pup African American puppeteers that create works with stop motion puppetry? Yes. Um, I have attempted that on one piece. I'm not doing it again anytime soon because <laughs> it's extremely time consuming. Um, I know that Jacqueline Wade, who is completing an MFA in integrated media at Hunter College, is working somewhat in that vein. And then Schroeder doesn't want to hear this because he thinks that there's a rigid distinction <laughs> between dolls and puppets. But I just finished an article about a community of African American women doll bloggers who were making videos, say, between 2010 and 2015. And some of them did use stop motion techniques. Wow. Um... There are absolutely amazing questions that are here. <laughs> um, wow, that yet again, we could spend a whole nother hour. So sorry, everybody, if we don't get to any, uh, it, uh, all of your questions, um, there are uh, some that were already answered in our overall conversation. I'm just scrolling down here to check out some more. Um, James Bradford Brewer, Black Puppeteer, uh, brings a certain rhythm to manipulation that is not always appreciated by others who hire. Um, get, let's talk about him for just a moment. Um, I, I have to admit, uh, Brad Brewer, uh, I'm a New Yorker, uh, born and raised on Long Island. And, um, you know, when I, I lived and worked in New York City, one of my thrills is to um, be it was my lunch hour at noon or uh, just or even a little bit after work was to run the Central Park. I actually worked right around 57th Street to see, um, even on a Saturday, to see the quotations. And mm -hmm. I was absolutely just blown away by um, uh, just, you know, it, the puppets are beautiful, but, but even the way that all of the puppeteers work together as one. We should describe um, it. We should describe the fact that they were crows. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Important. Right, so they were, they were crows that sang uh, 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 lip synced classic R and B tunes, probably from the what seventies, you know, type, and, mm -hmm. and and just great stuff. But just even uh, seeing them reunite at the um, Living Objects um, uh, weekend, where we all festival where we all got to, you know, got to perform for each other and just the tightness of them. Oh my goodness. Just from, from the puppet down to their whole body was just, the puppeteer was totally one with yeah. the puppet, but then even they were one as, you know, it like they picked up, like they were doing it, you know, from yesterday. They were, um, yeah, they were, they were very syncopated, which is why they were really popular right. in the park. People went and gathered in the park to see these guys perform. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, they, someone says here, like, why do you think people were didn't, you know, uh, always appreciate um, what he was doing? They're saying there are people who didn't appreciate it. I think, well, one of the challenges I've heard Brad talk about was the imagery. They were about to make a big deal with a major company, um, but yeah. somebody in the boardroom took offense to the Black Crows. And you want to talk about imagery, we're getting, that gets back to a stereotype and people's comfort level with different imagery. Someone was uncomfortable with the black crow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. The imagery and, and, and back to, you know, what's considered beautiful and acceptable. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I see a question from Carolyn Clark for, um, I think this is for Anwar. What has been your experience in the ju juvenile detention centers? Have the people been able to face difficult emotions with puppetry? How do you get them past the tough exterior they might rely on as a defense? So um, I haven't really had the opportunity. Uh, most recently, since I've been in grad school for the past three years, I've been doing sort of 90 minute uh, sessions 
and probably doing four of those a year. And so 90 minutes is not enough time to have the youth build the puppets, teach them how to operate a puppet and get into sort of uh, their trauma, the difficult, uh, the difficult conversations. And so I think really where I'm at in this practice right now is just learning how I will approach the situation when I say, for example, have a week long residency uh, to like work with youth, or I can go in on a more regular basis and develop relationships because that's largely what it's about as well is me as an adult black male going and speaking with other young black men and uh, going to them as an equal, you know, mm -hmm. going to them uh, as a service. I think some of their experiences are such that, um, you know, men are always butting heads. This is always a competition. And mm -hmm. so they just need to, you know, what I've been practicing is like building their trust and using the art as a means of sort of building their trust as well because when their minds are engaged, their hands are engaged, then there's a little bit of downtime from all of those defense mechanisms, right? And so that's what I'm learning is that you keep them engaged uh, and you know, with, with like low stakes projects that also can have like sort of a high return um, and model that return for them on the way in as well as present ideas of how if this is something they're into, you can go and make these puppets and do a puppet show for the kids in your neighborhood for $50 a show or something like that, right? So then show them, teach them what the actual sort of opportunities are as an entrepreneur and just beyond sort of the art making. Um, but I'm not, you know, I studied psychology and I would say more group psychology than uh, sort of individual therapy. So I, uh, I do see barriers come down with these youth, though I am not like the person trained to, you know, help them work through all of that. And that's why, you know, I'm interested in pushing puppetry and letting people know that I do it so I can find collaborators who, you know, have more of that psychology and therapy um, background. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, uh, Emily, you can go ahead and show the pictures, please, of the quotations. So, yeah, this is what we were talking about. Um, this group of men here who uh, they don't even live in the same state anymore. And they just they got together to do this um, magnificent show. And yeah, that's the initiative of it all was was absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Emily. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, all right. So, you know, Dr. Sabrina, hello, Dr. Sabrina Thomas. Um, she asked, how can someone find a puppeteer of color mentor? I've actually been getting um, a, a few questions uh, from people actually around the world who are asking for um, puppeteers of, uh, of color. So they're interested in puppetry, but they just don't know how to start and, and, and what to do. So. Um, let's do, say, Paulette, uh, then Schroeder, and then Anwar, okay? Okay. Well, I, um, I had typed a question into the chat box, but I don't know if the attendees can see it. First of all, where are you located, Dr. Sabrina? Um, and if we know where you're located, then we might know some people in your area that we yes. could put you in touch with. And I would I would say in this era in this era when a lot of people are going on video, you can look at puppet groups. There's a there's a group called um, Puppets of Our Own. There's another group of Black puppeteers. Find them on Facebook and see if you can make make a connection with anyone. And a lot of puppetry work is word of mouth. So it's someone someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone, and just keep digging. Well, Lauderdale. Oh, she's in my neck of the woods. Okay. All right, Edna, that's your okay. baby. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I got you, Sabrina. Not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> and um, I don't. Yeah. 
Oh, go ahead, please. Oh, I was going to say, I don't have any specific uh, resources regarding puppeteers of color who would be um, mentors, but I will say this, my experience with puppeteers thus far is that uh, we're generous people and always uh, interested in teaching. So I think, uh, yeah, you find one and there's a great, uh, great things will happen. Exactly. And I would just say, you know, um, just, you know, do you really have a passion for this? Do you really have a passion? I remember, uh, um, I can tell you, I was on a crosstown bus in New York City and I was just, it just something hit me like, I have to do this. If I don't do this, I'm going to die. You know, being, being the dramatic person that I am, but you know, and that's how I really felt. And then I just, you know, and, you know, if you're into something, just get it, be in it 200%. Okay. Yeah. There's some that are amateur, you know, people just, okay, this is cool. But if you really are falling in love and I fell in love with this art form, and I believe that every single one of these panelists here has fallen in love with this art form, that it is a passion to us. I mean, Schroeder is knocking out videos like I, I'm jealous because I'm like, every time he knocks out a video, I'm like, man, I should be doing a video, you know? Um, and Anwar, just your, your, the expansion of your mind of uh, how you're just, you know, just ah, with these puppets, it's amazing. And Paulette, with, with your research and just taking us to a different level and more in depth, um, I just absolutely love all you guys and everything that you're bringing um, to this table. and and. And the other puppeteers. So it's like, as we know, um, and we're all educators here, we're lifelong learners, right? And so just find those people, those articles, those videos, like we just mentioned. Um, and, you know, it, don't even stick with a per, just a person of color. Just find the excellence, okay? Mm -hmm. Find the puppetry excellence the, the, and the genre that you, um, that you just, you know, you feel that you can, that you love, that you're interested in. Uh, I know a little bit of everything, okay, over the 26 years of being a puppeteer, but I am a hand rod puppeteer. And so um, that's my number one thing. But uh, it, it's, it's still find that person or those people that um, to say, hey, look, can you just teach me? Can I sit and watch, okay? Um, uh and just study those videos okay uh and, and just just keep going so if this, this is something you really love to do guys just dive right into it dive right into it and uh, the door will open for you okay it absolutely will open for you um i uh, let's just finish up with some last words um uh, just parting words for everyone i guess i kind of said mine already uh so paulette if you may start please uh, I just say peace and blessings. <laughs> that's that's all I have at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I would say thank you for this opportunity just to share our puppetry imaginations. Um, follow us on Facebook. Look for each one of us in some format and make a connection. Yeah, I would just say thank you to uh, you know the Ballard Institute and Emily and John, and thank you to all of the other uh, you know panelists today this is just uh, you know this 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 is so cool this is really so cool and uh, this experience among like all the past and future ones are making this just like a really beautiful time in my life so thank you hey. yay and this conversation is is like i said we could go on for for hours or days and and there are so many branches to even each one of the questions that we uh, address this evening. Um, so um, hopefully we'll be able to do this again and do more of this. And um, uh, as Anwar just said, we we thank you very much, um, John Bell and Emily uh, Wicks uh, for this opportunity, um, Uni uh, University of Connecticut, the Ballard Institute and Museum. Uh, this was really a, a, an honor to be uh, part of this. So I turn this now over to Mr. John Bell. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. And, and thank you, Anwar and Paulette and, and Schroeder. Um, I wish this could happen every week, but maybe, <laughs> maybe it will somehow. Um, I, I hope that we can, the Ballard Institute can, can be part of making such things happen. 
Uh, I appreciate everybody coming to this. Uh, I hope uh, people will make use of, of all the materials at the in the Living Objects uh, website and especially the articles which I, we've been working on. Uh, but everything's been uh, all of the resources, uh, so much of which uh, Emily has shared with us. I want to thank Emily for doing everything really, really well in the back end and in the front end and everywhere. And uh, this, this uh, talk will be archived on our Facebook page and on YouTube. And just to let people know, our next forum is November 12th. Young Min Sung will talk about Shakespeare and puppetry in relation to an exhibit ongoing now. And December 12th, uh, professors Ed Weingart and Jason Lee from Yukon will talk with Basil Twist from New York about engineering in puppetry. So I hope that we will, Ballard Institute will continue to work with, with you, you guys and, and other African-American puppeteers. And so we can continue to learn and be inspired by your work. So thank you very much. And thanks everybody for attending. And this was more exciting than the presidential debate, I think. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's tonight. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's thank on you. now.